post-lunch session. How many of us are feeling a little sleepy and tired? You can be honest. No? All fresh? Or do we want to do a two-minute yoga nidra? Will that be good? Yes? No? How many yes for a yoga nidra? Just two to three minutes? Okay. Okay. So let's close our eyes. A power nap, a short power nap. Close our eyes and keep the phones in silence. And just relax. Just relax. Let's take a deep breath in. And breathe out. Wherever the mind is running, jumping, thinking, let's relieve our mind for some time and just bring it back to this moment. Let's take another deep breath in. Loosen your arms and relax. Let's another consciously take deep breath in. And with a smile, breathe out, relax. Let's become aware of our right leg. Take your attention to your right leg, the right foot, right calf muscle, knee, thigh, hip. Just consciously become aware of your right leg. Relax the right leg. Let's take a deep breath in and breathe out. Let's take our attention to our left foot. Just become aware of your left foot. Left calf muscle, left knee, left thigh. Become aware of your left hip and relax the left leg. Become aware of your left leg and let go, relax. Let's gently take our attention to our genitals, lower abdomen. Become aware of your navel region, stomach. Gently bring your mind to the chest. And relax. Let's take another deep breath in. And let go. Relax the body. Let's take our attention to our right shoulder. Right arm. Right palm. Become aware of your right arm completely. And let go. Let's take our attention to our left shoulder, left arm, fingers, the whole of the left arm, relax. Let's take our attention to the back of our body, lower back, upper back. Become aware of your neck, the neck region, all the muscles around the neck. Loosen, relax. Let's take a deep breath in. And with the smile, breathe out. If you can't make it, you can fake it. Keep a smile on the face. Take your attention to your chin. Become aware of your chin, lips. Right cheek, left cheek, just gently take your attention. Nose, right eye, left eye, the eyeballs, the forehead, the ears, relax the face. Take your attention to the top of the head, 
and let go. Let's take another deep breath in and breathe out. Loosen the body. Let's become aware of the whole body. Become aware of the ingoing breath that energizes the body and the outgoing breath that relaxes the body. As we breathe in, the body expands and as we breathe out, the body contracts. Just become aware. Relax the body. Another deep breath in. And breathe out. Completely let loose. Just keeping your eyes closed. You may just roll your neck, roll your shoulders, roll your wrists. And just stretch your body a little bit. You can stretch the muscles of your face. Nobody is watching you. Shake the legs a little bit. You can stretch. And whenever we are ready, taking our time, we may gently open our eyes. Does it feel good? The mind feels a little more in the moment. Yeah. Body is relaxed. This is very important. So now we go to the second session of the inaugural. And we have two beautiful sessions. Welcome, Professor K. Ramasubramaniam Ji <laughs> from IIT Mumbai. So nice to have you with us. So now we have two sessions. The first is in conversation with Professor Gautam Desi Rajuji, a scientist from Indian Institute of Science. Can we have his biodata displayed? And may I invite Professor Gautam Desi Rajuji to please come up on the stage. He has authored a book by the name of Bharata 2. O zero, and with him conversing will be Raghava Krishna ji, the CEO and founder of Brihat Culture Limited. The other panelist in the session of in conversation with is Sri Ram ji, Sri Ram Bala Subramaniam ji. He was supposed to be here with us today, but he fell ill. He will be joining us online at about 3 p.m. We wind up this session, both the, it's, the session is about the books that Gautam Desi Rajaji and Sri Ram Ji have written. Sri Ram Ji's book is Kautilyanomics and Raghava Krishna Ji will be conversing with them and Raghava Ji will we have a question answer session where, wherein participants could ask something? A quick one. 3.45, 3.45. And then we have Professor Mahadevan Ji from IIM Bangalore. He has already reached IIT Kharagpur and he will be joining us from 3 p.m. for his last session of the day. So over to Raghava Krishna ji and Gautam Raju ji for in conversation with. Is there a hand mic here? Hand mic is there? Are these uh, mics working, Mahesh ji? These table mics are working? Oh, there is a hind mic here.
I'm just seeing if this is working certainly. This is working. But it has We will probably share this one. I'll quickly make some introductory co comments and then we can. Is this okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So the common refrain uh, that we've had all through the sessions in the morning was about how IK should be future forming. We're looking back only to create the future. But the process of future formation is something that needs a deeper contemplation. One of the most important ingredients, and this is coming to us from any kind of learning motivation theory that you might study, is that we learn by mimicking. You need an exemplar. You need a role model, particularly if the education policy is talking about a multidisciplined mind. And if you all concur that the genius of the Indian knowledge system was the cultivation of the mind, which was able to look at things in an integral fashion. You need all of that to be concretized in human form. We learn when we see somebody who embodies that, and that becomes a source of inspiration, that becomes a source of mimicking, and through the process of imitation, we imbibe and we learn and we grow. And during this process, you also have adversity. And adversity becomes your friend, your ally, because you're able to recognize the growth in yourself. So the important uh, thing when we imagine a multidisciplined mind is to have an exemplar, is to have somebody that we can look at and say, this is what a multidisciplined mind looks like. And I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to be sharing the stage and having a conversation for all of us uh, with a multidisciplined mind par excellence. Somebody who surveyed everything from chemistry to constitution and all the things that come in between. Sir, welcome and very, very happy and delighted to share this stage with you and hello, have this conversation. Hello, hello. hello. Uh, I've been interacting with Sir since last night. He might be a bit tired with all uh, our questions and our, <laughs> uh, our demands of, on his time. Uh, but it's been an absolute revolution, just the last 24 hours, uh, interacting uh, and understanding how this mind works and what, what is the inspiration for somebody who's done a lifetime's work in nation building. Uh, so firstly, I'd like you to help us locate your work in the context of Indian knowledge systems, coming from chemistry and uh, all the scientific uh, endeavors that uh, you have undertaken. And you're looking at this new discourse of a knowledge system, and we're calling it the Indian knowledge system. How do we think about your book and how do we look at your work in the context of Indian knowledge systems? We begin from there and we get into the context of the book itself. Well, thank you so much, Raghav, for these nice words. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here in the IKS uh, workshop. And uh, I regret that I'll not be able to spend more time than uh, today at the workshop. The program really looks good. Now, what is this book on the Constitution uh, and federalism and so on? doing in an IKS workshop? I think this is a natural question that you posed. And uh, actually there is a great deal of relevance. See, whichever way we look at it, we are in an Indian education revolution today. We know, we sense that whatever we've been doing so far is 
somehow may be either insufficient or may be even incorrect. Uh, so as part of this revolution, and all revolutions, they completely remove the old order. There is no sign of the old order after the revolution is completed. So let's not be unaware of that. Hmm. This uh, revolution is never a consensus. It's, it's important to know that. And uh, in this education revolution, and more so in the context of the scientific subjects, because I also am here in front of you as a scientist. In the scientific education context, there are a number of issues that are non-scientific and also non-economic, which are still very important for this education revolution to take place. It's not just a matter of changing the education system. What are these non-scientific, non-economic factors? First and most important, again, from the point of view of this gathering is the civilizational reworking that's going on now. And integrating India's reawakening with respect to its identity, its core identity. Hmm, this is coming back. Almost as important are reforms in the judiciary and law enforcement. Unless these things are done properly, much of what we are doing in other spheres will be actually meaningless. Hmm, it will be like some armchair debates and some adda, you know tea, drinking tea, coffee, etc., that kind of thing. It will degenerate into that. Also, closely allied with this is administrative reform. This has got nothing to do with science or economics. These have to do with basic changes that must take place in the country before all our dreams can be realized into something tangible. Also in a time-bound fashion, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but, but not forever, not for 75 years. We have waited too long. It is also connected with our education system, believe me. A total defense rejig and the use of artificial intelligence also in wars. Because unless we are strong, we will not be able to have a secure boundary in order to do our own thing safely inside. We will be susceptible as we are today to all kinds of wars. Today, you know, we have what are called hot wars in cold places. It is not a war which is fought with weapons and atom bombs and all. It is, you know, it is a war of minds when people are trying to take over your mind by doing something else, which IKS is strongly connected with. And then comes to the non-scientific, non-economic thing most connected with my book, deep and urgent constitutional changes of the type that will need a new constituent assembly rather than just amendments. Okay. Unless we do that, your IKS and all that will not, will not see the light of day. You may start a niche university, you may start a niche department, you may do all these things, and you may slowly try to influence people in a positive manner, make them aware of, but unless you have the state support, fairly soon I would say, it cannot, it's not something that can be put off forever. Unless you have these constitutional changes, and now coming more into the education front, the matter of decentralization or federal structure and the states beginning to feel a little more that they are part of the whole. In supramolecular chemistry or systems biology, in any study of the complex system, we say the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The whole is the union. The parts are the states. Without strong states, you cannot have a strong union. We are under the fallacy of, fallacy of the present constitution 
that strong union means weak states and strong states means weak union. This false uh, antagonism should also be removed. So this is the overall context which is why I wrote this book. Bharat, India 2.0. And this is really in, in answer to your question that what, what am I doing here in IKS? In fact, I was asked to give a lecture originally by Richa Ji on the zinc metallurgy and some of the advances in Indian chemistry. Uh, director this morning referred to P-series book on Hindu chemistry and so on. Yes, I could easily have given that lecture. That was not the issue. But I somehow felt that this was something that I felt more like conveying to this audience as to why the overall umbrella and canopy of everything you know, has to be moving together with all of us as individuals, as thinking individuals and also with the state coming in and actively, you know, the difference I have talked in the book about difference between Rashtra and Rajya. We all want Hindu Rashtra, nobody wants Hindu Rajya because that would be a theocracy of a kind that we don't want really. We've never, it is not compatible with Sanatan Dharma anyway, the idea of Hindu Rajya. We've never had it. The moment you separate, you keep Brahmins and Kshatriyas different, there is no question of a theocracy anymore. I mean, it's already there, it's encoded in our basic DNA. So that's not what we want. So to put some of these ideas forward, and also as you said, to give a solution in terms of smaller states, that's why this book is written and I believe that is the context with which I am actually sitting here. <laughs> Thank you for that, sir. Uh, you know, we've mentioned this in the morning as well when we think about the roadmap for IKS implementation and the manifestation of the vision in a concrete form. We said that the top of the layer is always the executive commitment and the umbrella under which all of us can operate. And this book is actually a great example of what the design of that top layer should be like. The essential concern of this book is threefold. What is the nature of our history in the last 100, 150 years? What were the seminal movements in the last uh, 100 years from, let's say, 1895 to 1909, to 1919, to 1935, and then 1947 and 1950. These are the milestones that you would notice when you read this book. And it talks about how the journey has actually led us to a situation where the operating software that we have is perhaps not compatible with the resident body itself. And I would like you to just expand on that a little bit for us, sir. The idea of federalism, which is coming from your survey of the history and what has led to the current part, so if you could just talk to us through the main themes and also the key events, how should we look at the past, how should we register this before we think about the solution that you have? Uh, very, very briefly, because the whole thing is quite expansive, what you have. Uh, so the constitutional history of India began in 1896 with the Swaraj constitution, inspired by Annie Besant and Lokmanya Tilak. And then there were several documents from the Indian side and from the British side. And uh, sometimes these met, converged, sometimes they diverged, all sorts of things. So that by the time the Constituent Assembly was set up in 46, we had 50 years of literature survey already. So when you write a PhD thesis or write a paper or something, you see what has happened before you. Question is, did that literature of 50 years, did it influence these people? If it did, how? If it didn't, why not? Was that influence a benign influence or was it a malign influence? The co comment that we have uh, British laws for Indian people, that the Government of India Act 1935, some of these things are very well known. So what I have tried to do is summarize in the way in which a scientist might feel. One of the things I have always felt in writing my scientific papers is that you are the researcher is free to emphasize or de-emphasize anything in the literature. So you are not obliged to give, say, equal weightage to all facts. But in order to try to, you know, in the hindsight of history, we can also say, I mean, the separate electorates for Muslims started with the Morley Minto reforms. 
and it looks like, it looks like, I'll be careful now with my words, it looks like Lord Minto actually encouraged the All India Muslim League to be formed in 1906 in Dhaka and he said that you are getting your separate, separate electorates. So with that encouragement they started the Muslim League. So the British had already put the, you know, uh, they had already started the mischief by 1909. And uh, other things are well known, not to some of you youngsters maybe, but I think that's why you should also read the book. Who is Syed Ahmad Khan? Why did he change his whole personality from uh, nationalist to separatist? What were the economic reasons that led to the Muslims feeling like an enclosed group in India? The reason was economic. That's why they started feeling isolated. Because they had lived with Hindus for six, seven hundred years. Why did they suddenly start feeling threatened after 1858? I think these are all things you should know. And you should read for yourselves, not listen to some XYZ on Twitter and listen to all, you know, rubbish nonsense that they write. You find out for yourself why these things happen. Why is it that the population, and that comes to chapter 3, the population of Muslims in undivided India in 1947 was only 25%. Why is it that this large land mass resisted conversion so much? And that's because we are a civilizational state. And that is the shortest chapter in the book, but if you want to ask, tell my opinion, it is the pivotal chapter. I don't like people yawning in front of me, please. I hate it and in all my lectures I always say that I don't like it. So if you want to yawn, go to the hostel room and lie down. Now, what, hap what is the civilizational state? The civilizational state now comes with Sanatan Dharma. That is our canopy. It is our leading light. It concerns the whole universe. It is, you know, what is that? Uh, this uh, Aneka Koti Brahmanda Janani Divya Vigraha. What is this Aneka Koti Brahmanda? It goes, you know, all over the place. It is beyond time and distance. Uh, so, this, it is this particular thing that makes us unique. There are only two civilizational states in the world, big ones, India and China. And there are different kinds of civilization states because we are pluralistic and they are not. So, this is also explained. There is a third very interesting place which is trying to become a civilizational state and that is Russia today. So, this what this Russia does if you read the works of Alexander Dugin, you will find out that they are trying, you see they, Putin and uh, he is saying that the whole experiment of Russia looking west since the time of Peter the Great was all a big waste of time. This is what he is saying. So he says that this is a Eurasian civilization which is quite different. So to, when you take Huntington's clash of civilizations, he talked about the Muslims versus the rest of the world. I don't think that is really a civilizational war. That is a war for the energy resources of the world. That is an economic war maybe. The real civilizational war is Bharat Varsha versus the rest of the world. And that's why I wrote in the theme of the book, India did not start this war but Bharat will finish it. You know, that is the real civilizational war of today, which is the war in which we are all involved. It is not a war with weapons. Because Bharat Varsha has never wanted territory beyond Bharat Varsha. You know, Bharata Varsha, Bharata Kande, Jambu Dvipe, that is all that we want. We don't want anything more than that. From the ocean to the mountain, in the island, where the children of Bharata live, all those dvipas, the last most convergent one is this Jambu dvipa. That is where we are sitting now. And with that Mount Meru on top. So, th th we have never asked for territory outside. But that is why we Indians are very sensitive to loss of territory. Which is why partition was traumatic. We are very, very sensitive to loss of sacred civilizational space. 
It is not jhelam, it is called vitastha. It is not taksila, it is takshashila. I see the building here, takshashila opposite us. When we came here. The real takshashila we can't go. We can't even associate today with Lavapura. You know, it, it is a place which doesn't mean anything to us. Lavapura is the biggest city in Pakistan today. We can't go there. We don't even know what it is. I'm talking about Lahore. I hope you know that. That is the old name of Lahore. So, when you lose civilization space, you have lost a lot. And so, the, the partition runs through this book completely. It has changed all of us. Not just people of Bengal and Punjab who were affected directly. I mean, that, you can't compare the tragedies of Bengal and Punjab with the rest of us. But I think all of us, Sanatanis and Bharatiyas, have been affected by this partition. So why was it allowed to happen? I think there chapter 1 says a little bit about it. And I think the effect of partition was on our constitution, Raghav. Because I read the debates. 165 days they debated. And I read all the debates, all the days. And I wrote notes for everything. Covid might have troubled many people, but it helped me because I couldn't go to the lab, I couldn't go to the institute. So I sat at home and I was reading all these debates and writing things down. So they were all nationalistic people. There was no Tukde Tukde in that uh, constituent assembly. Nobody. No, nobody. They could have many wildly different political opinions. But nobody there was Tukde Tukde. And they were all traumatized by partition. I think they, they never felt that partition would actually happen. And there was talk about it all the time. From 1909, there was talk about this thing, Khilafat and all that nonsense. And uh, after 31, and then Jinnah, and then Jinnah telling Ambedkar that SCs were not Hindus. And uh, all this discussion was going on. But it was only around 41, 42 that people like Ambedkar, Rajendra Prasad, Rajaji started telling Nehru and Gandhi that it is better that we have partition. And I think they were more realistic, they were more pragmatic. In fact, I think Patel even finally came down, um, uh, I think Ambedkar said, he said, we cannot afford to keep Muslims in this country. It was coming down to that by 41, 42. So, but even then when partition actually happened, I think they were traumatized. They didn't realize suddenly that, you know, I believe Nehru wept on the 18th of August or something when he was told that Lahore had gone on the other side. And he, so finally they realized that that is what partition was going to mean. Okay. And I think it is because of that, till then the sentiment in the Constituent Assembly was strongly federal. They suddenly became unionist because they feared a second partition. Because half the Muslims, after having voted for partition, did not go there. And I think everybody was a bit scared that had there been a second partition shortly thereafter on religious lines, then believe me, this country would have collapsed. That I think, I think their anxiety was well founded, justified. And so now today in hindsight, we can't say why are they bending over backwards in this constitution? You know, this article 25, etc., etc. Why were they all written in that kind of a lopsided fashion? Almost like bending over backwards to please Muslims. I think they were scared that there would be a second partition. I mean, whether that fear was justified or not and whether it should have come into the constitution, that I know not. But I think that is part and parcel of the story. And then I uh, described that there are so many fault lines in the constitution. But the main, main thing is that the basic civilizational nature of this land is not expressed in this constitution. This constitution is a very sterile document. <laughs> you know, it's I'm strong words, but I think this is a place of education. We are all educated people. We are not some Twitter rabble. I think we have a duty to ourselves and to the general public at large to be able to start questioning why they did all these things. And if the constitution was bad, Nehru's amendments were worse. I think he really sort of, and whatever he didn't do, his daughter did. 
So between the father and daughter, I mean, the whole thing was mangled and totally out of shape. So that then what we have been living with in the last 50 years, also compounded by coalition governments, I think is where we find ourselves today. That's why I said, people have asked me, why you wrote India 2.0? What was India 1.0? I said, India 2.0, in my opinion, has not yet started. I think we have to work towards it. But one thing I'm sure, India 1.0 ended on the 14th of May 2014. <laughs> that will never come back. We will never get to that monarchic situation that we had. And probably for all intents and purposes, in the form in which it exists now, the Congress party, which I believe fair and square is responsible for all our ills in this country today, that will not exist. Not for much longer. I think it, it, it will be there in some kind of a shadowy form. Some Bharat Jodo or something like that. It, 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 it's like a, like a circus. Not, not really a something serious. Something else may take its place. I, that I don't know. But 1.0 Congress party, Gandhi family, I think that is gone forever. So it's up to us now to create India 2.0. It's up to all of you, all you young boys and girls, like your previous fellows who came to IIT Kharagpur, don't run away to America. Above all, whatever you do, don't go to America. Anyway, that country is collapsing. So if you want to go and join some collapsing regime, go then. I, mean, uh, I remember at the time when the Chinese were coming up, many Chinese postdocs and professors and all that, they said, in, they were in America and they said, this is not a time when we should not be in China. We must be in China now. And then they all went back. I think that is what, now you people don't even have to go there. Please don't go. Whatever it is, please be here and do your bit to make India 2.0 a reality. How to convert India into Bharat? And in the last Section. sections, sections of the book, you know, there's a very good book written by Harsh Madhusudan and Rajiv Mantri uh, called uh, A New Idea of India. And uh, so they say that, well, the old idea of India is the Congress idea. So they said a new idea of India, this is what we want. And so they said the previous one was the idea of India. That was a very imperious statement from the Congress saying the idea of India, as if there is no other idea. And uh, so, they, they, yeah, so then I, I think that uh, this is the only section, I think we'll end with this. Uh, I read just a paragraph from the very last pages of the book, which is, uh, by the way, incidentally, just I'll share an anecdote with you, uh, sometimes interesting to know. Many of my books I have written not in the order of the book. But I have written a later chapter earlier and all that. This Bharat book was written in the order in which they appear in the book itself. So I started with the introduction and went, usually in my three earlier books, the introduction chapter I used to write towards the end. And here I wrote it. And the other thing was not only did I write it in the order, my speed of writing was increasing as I was writing the book. So chapter 1 was written, I think, the most slowly and chapter 5, literally in a few days, I finished it. So, I see, what, what happens is, let, let me just read, this is the last thing, I think we're running out of time. And uh, yeah, so, so, see, the Congress, force feeding of the Congress idea of India is bound to provoke a counter-reaction especially at a time when the country was veering away from artificial socialism and secularism of the older India. It did not take long for Savarkar to be rediscovered. And it was pointed out that his ideas, refined by Shama Prasad Mukherjee and others, constituted an alternative idea of India. Hmm. I'm not saying that this idea is better or that idea is better, it is an alternative idea. Ideas became associated with political parties, which is only natural, because only those political parties survive in a democracy that have clearly defined ideologies. That's why I think Kejriwal is not going to last, because he doesn't have a clearly defined ideology, except cheating and, you know, uh, telling lies. So that's, that's not enough of an ideology to keep a political party going. 
I make strong statements, eh? you shouldn't, I always make them. That's why people either like me or dislike me totally. So it's okay, that's, that's my personality, I can't help it. Uh, Madhusudan and Mantri have emphasized with great wealth of detail and concrete examples that a new approach to our administrative structures, see he again refers to administration, which I talked about in the beginning of this thing. A new approach to our administrative structures, basically removal of Babu Giri, is an important part of the newness of their idea of the country. However, after all these ideas have been done with and dusted, there remains the oldest idea of India, which is also the best, that is Sanatan Dharma. That is, that is the best idea. Now, now look, now what I say, this is what others have said. And always in a book when you write, when you write a paper or something, what's the difference between a paper and a review article? In a paper means you have to say your own thing also, not just say what other people have said. Many times the social science people, they are very good at saying what, repeating what other people have said. They have, have they said any new things on their own? Eh? Uh -uh. Zero. Sunya. They find a gap, they find something, they do a good analysis. Some of them are quite good at doing that analysis. All researchers are trained to do analysis. Yeah. You know, we can do it. But, so I've written, if, this is my new stuff now. If Madhusudan and Mantri have a problem with the word the, in the phrase the idea of India. So they said the idea of India is very imperious and overbearing. So we will make it a, an idea of India. And then they said, they further tempered it, a new idea of India. Nice. Both, are, I know them both well. Both are very, very pleasant young men. So they, it suits their personality. No, I am not such a nice personality. So I said, I have a problem. They may have a problem with the word the. I have a problem with the word India. There are already two completely contradictory ideas of India. The above authors have now supplied a new idea of India. After a while, a better idea of India will be suggested. India to me is an idea and just that. We do not like to remember Churchill a lot in this country. Especially in Bengal, he is not liked at all. We do not like to remember Churchill a lot in this country, but he was among the first to express the notion of India as an idea. He said it's like the equator. He said it's nothing more than that, something like something other. So like all ideas, it is open to discussion and debate, India. It is a hypothesis which needs to be supported with data before it becomes a theory. A theory is something that predicts and in the best case forbids. And in this manner it stays on till it is falsified as Karl Popper would have it. The Nehruvian hypothesis, Madhusudan and Mantri are at pains to explain that this may not correspond to the person called Nehru. Yes, Nehru started it, but Indira Gandhi, that whole thing, that... Nurul Hassan and all these things that he did with our education policy, all that is that Congress idea of India, was sought to be forcibly converted into a theory. They were taking a hypothesis and trying to make it into a theory with false facts. That's what they were doing in the scientific language I'm saying. And they were trying to forcibly convert it into a theory through the aegis of a constitution that was dis deformed and distorted by Nehru and his daughter. So like all false theories, falsification occurred easily, as it must for any unsound theory. And unambiguously enough, if the 2014 election result is any indication. That means the people of India have said that this is a false theory, we don't believe it. And I think the electoral savviness of the BJP simply means that they knew what the people are thinking and they were able to communicate it back to the people. And only in 2019, didn't, doesn't mean they became greater. They were able to communicate even better what the people were thinking. So as long as the political party goes on being able to express that better and better to the people, finally when we are, you know, if we feel that a political fellow is at least reflecting accurately what we are thinking, that's usually enough for us to vote for him. We don't, Indian electorate is quite kind. It's not a cruel electorate. <laughs> you know, we give benefit of the doubt. So, the, he's at least telling us what, you know, this is correct. You know, so that's why we're voting for them. 
So countries can be made and unmade. But a theory is a reality as opposed to a mere idea. And in the immediate time scale, there is no better description of the reality of this land than the nation Bharat. So I have no problem with the word Bharat. I have every problem with the word India. And that is basically, you know, Raghav, the thesis of this book. So in long and short, you know, I think this is, this is what I'm talking about. The rest of the book, you know, all examples and thing and thing and thing. Federalism, you said smaller states. Why will smaller states help? Etc. Etc. But I've given a solution in the form of smaller states, which I believe is something that uh, serious readers of the book should read, Chapter Four, and uh, do go go out there, try to buy it, try to read it. Like all my scientific papers, it is heavy reading. My former PhD students, they are very very amused. Uh, one of them, who is a professor here in this institute, told me he said he was very amused. So I said I knew why he was amused. He said, uh, uh, when I read the book, I feel I'm reading something very familiar, but the subject matter is completely <laughs> different. <laughs> so I haven't changed my writing style in writing this book. It was great fun. And I have written it for all young people of this country. So please read it, talk to your friends, tell them about it, start tearing it up to bits, say that Desiraju doesn't know what he's talking about, and then who is he to tell us what to do? Say all the things, but... You, when you criticize, don't criticize like in Twitter. Criticize once you have got data in your hand and you have got a basis for that criticism. Indian knowledge system is all about that. Yeah. You know, it says, it says exactly that, that you know, if something is shown to be wrong because you have got so much empirical data against it and so on, if it is wrong means though it is wrong. Yeah. Nobody has said something and saying this is true forever and ever. The whole basis of Indian knowledge system is a heuristic one that you learn from your experiences and then you put it forward. This is, how, this is the only way in which we can understand complex systems today. Whether it is monsoon prediction, whether it is cure, ultimate cure for cancer which is still not coming, whether it is specialized medicines based on each individual's, individual's DNA for themselves, whether it is any of these things. It can only be done by a study of complexity, fractals, you know, this whole business, today's problems, even international relations today is complexity. We had only bipolar world. Today we have four empires. You have USA, China, India, Russia. So how would this, uh, there's a great mathematician here. He will tell us how many interactions there will be between four different bodies, each of them behaving dynamically. So the job of S. J. Shankar is quite difficult today. To try to see, you know, we are one of the four. How do we play the game with the other three? Who may sometimes be friends with each other, sometimes be enemies. In chemistry we say that, you know, two-body problem, three-body problem, multi-body problem. It's very, very awfully difficult to predict a crystal structure. Because same kinds of factors. See, the whole thing, the general, the basic way of thinking in all these modern problems of science can be found in our Indic systems. And that is where we have to go. I think that is what the purpose of this workshop also should be. And to try to tell them that, you know, as Winnie the Pooh says, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. And so it's just different manifestations. How can it be otherwise? We are the only civilization in the world, the only religion in the world, where we say the same thing can be perceived in six different ways, all of which are equally true. Huh? Who else says that? Six darshanas is enough to tell you that, you know, Sasranamam says that she is Bahurupa and she is also Nirdvaita. So how do you reconcile both these things at the, at the same breath practically? So I think it is something that is up to all of you now to take and do and all that. Mine is just one, you know, silly... Uh, exercise that I have done in order to try to get this thing going, increase the discussion please, please talk about it more, talk to your friends and uh, as I said I was telling some of our youngsters here yesterday and you Raghav also, we, this I am talking as a chemist, that chemistry is usually considered to be the victory of kinetics over thermodynamics. So usually we don't care if we get the best solution but we want the fastest solution. 
also add that point about S20. Now that India has S20. Assumed, <laughs> S20. India has assumed the leadership of G20. Yes. Uh, and you have a particular role uh, on science. Yeah, pretty big role, I think, yeah. So maybe very quickly, I know that we're running out of time. but very Yeah, S20, I mean, G20, I suppose all of you know, that it is the G7 countries were expanded to 20 countries, which is 19 countries plus the EU. I think that was done about, what, 13 years ago, 14 years. So, for the first time this year, now, well, 2023, India has assumed the presidency of the G20, which means all the G20 activities will be conducted in India. Yes, G20 has now got seven, eight, nine verticals, of which one of the verticals is science. So, that is called S20. So, S20 will uh, summarize all the action points of the G20 countries in form, in terms of international science, global cooperation, big worldwide problems like climate change and uh, energy, environment, health, water, all these things and put it together and put a final note to the G20 secretariat. All the verticals notes will be taken by the secretariat and finally put in a, a cogent form by the Prime Minister who will declare it to the other countries. So this S20, there is a very small engagement group of three people, of which I am one, and we basically have to manage and organize the 11 scientific meetings which will happen next year. And uh, we plan to have certainly one of the themes that we have proposed and accepted also, I mean, we, they, we accept now because India is the president, so whatever we say, it is the, that is what it's going to be. So the role of... Uh, I mean, the connection between science on the one hand and society and culture on the other. So this is where India can take, yeah, really it can take the lead for this. And so one of our, one of our five meetings will be on this. And so Dr. Vijay Bhatkar, who is the chairman of Vigyan Bharti, is one of the members. Uh, Ajay Sood, who is a PSA, is the second member. I am the third member. So these three people will have to sit and do all the things. The secretariat of this... Uh, S20 is not Vigyan Bharti, it is not PSA office, but it's Indian Institute of Science. Ah, they have told that also. And so Indian Institute of Science is the secretariat. So we will be doing all the things. And in that respect, the director of Indian Institute of Science, Professor Rangarajan, is supposed to assist us to get all these things going. Wonderful, and so this is the story of S20. So I'm looking forward to cooperation from all of you people and please feel free to send inputs, outputs, whatever it is we can do. And I have been given this, you know, responsibility at a very short notice. I don't know how on earth we are going to be able to manage. And, uh, you know, now we have got to put this whole structure, you know, so we about what we are trying to do to the foreign audience. The, all these foreign mi science ministers of all these countries will show up. And then, you know, they are all hard-boiled people. So, we have got to do something about it. But since you asked about S20, so you'll see me a little bit out of circulation for many things because whole of next year I think I can see myself quite preoccupied with it. And that's a great pedestal for Indian knowledge system, sir. Uh, we are with you. So thank you and all the best. I don't think we have time for questions, but sir is here till evening. I'm here till the evening. Till the evening. Uh, so those of you who want to have an interaction, you can try and connect for this. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wasn't it beautiful, the session? Yes? Really beautiful session, sir. Really beautiful. Very nice. So we'll just have a five-minute break, not a break, and then we have our second speaker, Sriram Balasubramanyamji, the author of Cotillionomics. He would be joining online, and we'll have a smaller session. We'll wind up the session by 3.45, latest 3.50. And then we have Professor Mahadevanji with us here. He has just come to the campus for the 
chief guest address that we are having post lunch now and then we close today's session with professor somesh kumar's remarks within 4:30 latest yes yeah so we'll just start in the next 3 to 4 minutes is uh, shriram ji already online yeah. we can have his bio data Raghav ji, whenever you are ready, you can just let me know. Yeah. There is a tea break, but that is at four thirty. Madan ji is he online? Shri Ram ji is not online. <clears throat> Can we see him on the screen? I see some students of IIT who did the FTP 2020. Do I recognize some of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Namaste, Shri Ram ji. Are we audible? Your mic is muted. Yeah, mic is muted. Namaste. Can you hear me? All right, I can speak from here. Uh, Shiram, you are able to hear me? Yes, Raghav. But uh, sometimes it goes on and off. But yeah, I am able to hear now. Okay. Hopefully, it stays uh, on and not off. I hope you're feeling okay. Uh, we're missing you here, but uh, <coughs> thank you for taking time out. Uh, know that you're unwell. Uh, so we just had a very interesting conversation on the backdrop of the uh, Indian Constitution and what has uh, evolved and and you know what has impacted us since 1947 and continues to. It was a very provocative session, and I think it's only pertinent uh, that from the immediate past we also take a look at the conceptual thought. that has framed the indian idea of state design i must admit and i told this to shri ram as well when i read the book that i was a bit skeptical because the book is kautilyanomics and i suspected that there is now a trend to distill easy management insights from the shastra but i was wrong when i read the book i looked at the intensity on two levels one was to help us understand how you approach a shastra there is a whole section in the book on the language and on the structure of that language to even approach a shastra that was to me a very very pleasant uh, uh, you know experience the second dimension which is excellent about this book and i would highly recommend that all of you engage with that is that it is once again about the future it takes into account the concerns of environment it takes into concerns the uh, the challenge of economic management towards ecology and it gives us a moral vision for how an ancient text can inform the future So Shri Ram, very excited to talk to you about this, and uh, once again, thank you for exploring one of the lesser explored dimensions of Artha Shastra, which is the Artha part. Right? So uh, look forward to having this conversation with you. We have the audience here, composed of uh, different faculty from uh, multiple universities, and we have uh, some luminaries of the Indian knowledge systems listening to you today. Welcome, welcome to FTP uh, 2022 at IIT Kharagpur. You're able to hear me, okay, Shri Ram? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, firstly, uh, if you could just uh, uh, help us understand, uh, for those who are interested in the subject, what was uh, what was your approach to the Artha Shastra, and uh, how did you get uh, into the text, and what was your moral vision as it guided you uh, when you started engaging with it? Uh, thank you. So, uh, first of all, thanks for providing me this good opportunity uh, to present my work. uh and i apologize i couldn't make it uh, to the event physically um on your question related to the book 
I think the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Arthashastra is often looked at, um, um, you know, through, through the political prism, um, uh, the Chyanaki Niti part of it, um, or it's looked at through the self-help uh, sort of, uh, you know, business part of it. Uh, but, but the real meat of the Arthashastra is the Artha. Um, so that was something which is completely lacking in any form of research. Uh, so I was, I just chanced upon this text uh, while I was working on Angus Madison's data set. Angus Madison is an economic historian. I think a lot of people use his numbers, but very few people actually look into what is work. Um, so he had produced a data, data set which gives you a thousand years of you know, global GDP and GDP per capita. Um, and India and China were top of the uh, charts for till about 17th century. So my intuitive understanding was that there had to be some framework, uh, you know, some uh, economic framework which had to facilitate this. And I think that's where the Arthashastra came. Uh, and I started looking uh, into the text. Uh, first of all, is first part of it is the Sanskritam text, uh, dealing with Sanskritam scholars um, and uh, engaging with Sanskritam scholars. Um, uh, the second part of it is is the financial slash economic part of uh, uh, extracting a theory on what Kautilya had, had uh, articulated, and the third part is to contextualize it to today's times. So these were sort of you know three huge challenges uh, uh, for the book, and it had to sort of uh, be compelling for each of these type of readers. So you know the Sanskrit scholar uh, like Professor Ramasubramaniam. Uh, should be happy with the book, or the public policy expert like Dr. Raghav uh, yourself, uh, uh, you know, should be happy with the book, and also a common reader, someone in my family who doesn't understand either of these, <laughs> should get something out of the book. So I think that was a real challenge in, in sort of articulating this message. Uh, and you're right, I mean, the idea of sustainable growth, since we talked about sustainability, it is central to the pillars that I discussed in the book. Uh, you know, we talk about a non, uh, a state which is yeah, rule enforcing but doesn't intrude. And then I talk about wealth creation, which Cotillia puts center uh, in, in his treatise, and the idea of sustainable growth uh, through the prism of responsibility, societal responsibilities, family responsibilities, also environmental responsibilities. So one of the sort of uh, uh, points within the sustainability prism is that uh, generally, we talk about the rule of law and responsibilities as sort of, you know, non-inclusive. Uh, I sort of argue that Kautilya thinks that both of them can be complementary. In the sense, you could have a state which enforces the rule of law, and you could have society and its responsibilities providing sort of a support system to, to sort of enhance uh, uh, the policymaker's sort of uh, ability to uh, 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 execute his policies. Uh, so that's sort of a complementary effect on the sustainability prism, which I think I had to the day. So, yeah, this is, uh, I think I sort of tried to answer your question quickly, but yeah, this is how I end. Well, thank you for that. I think that gives us a way to explore the book. Uh, I would like for you to expand a little bit on the framework that you've given us to read with. Of course, the challenges are complex and they are all interrelated. Uh, but you propose the idea of Yeah, so I think, you know, for, for us, uh, dharma is a very sort of loaded word because there are many meanings, uh, you know, we have many interpretations of the word for dharma. Uh, but in, in, in Kautilya's word, worldview, I think in terms of public policy, uh, he saw it as sort of a, a self-correcting mechanism between the market and the state. Uh, in very simple terms, we in, in, in the overall macroeconomy, we have the state, we have the market. So if there are any interventions that need to be made, either the state increases taxes or, you know, builds, you know, infrastructure, builds projects, um, or the state, you know, gives direct benefit transfers, for example. So the state does all these things to, to sort of intervene in the economy. And the same with the market. So the market has its own fluctuations uh, and people intervene in the market, to sort of stabilize it and things like that. But what Kautilya says is that uh, the idea of dharma could be something which can self-correct both of them. 
rather than you know just changing uh, these two binaries. So, for example, if there is say corruption in the state, uh, you know the idea of dharma could actually ensure that more dharmic society could ensure that the state and and the, and the competence of the state could be less corrupt, uh, and there could be mechanisms sort of derived. So, Kautilya saw dharma as sort of a foundation uh, and a self-correcting mechanism. So, basically. His thinking was that the more you enhance the sort of dharmic fabric, the more uh, the state and the market are sort of, you know, uh, their burdens are lesser. Uh, and, and, and this ensures there's more sustainability. So that's where the, the idea of dharmic capitalism comes. Uh, and in terms of the competence of it, I think if you read the book, you, you get a better sense. But uh, the broader sort of pillars, I would say, is uh, the roles of ethics, our responsibilities and also a, 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 a broader worldview of, of um, uh, uh, sort of an internationalist approach. Um, and this is something, you know, which is, um, uh, which, which is something often ignored in the sense that if you look at, say, thousand years of history or more, we, there were very few civilizations which were as open in terms of trade, in terms of engaging with the world as ours. Um, you know, the last probably 60, uh, you know, till the, till the 1990s, post-independence was probably the only time where we were so sort of closeted in, in, in our uh, thinking. But for the rest of history, if you look at, you know, right from Kautilya's time, right from the, you know, other Hindu kingdoms, right, uh, the Cholas, Chenas, Pandyas, the Vijayanagar Empire, all of them had, you know, uh, uh, extensive international trade. All of them had, you know, uh, many people like, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal has talked about maritime routes. Um, so the idea of a sort of a, a, an open uh, mind frame was something which is the status quo, not the other way around. Um, so the the pillar of the army capitalism at, at, a, at a conceptual level where Dharma plays a sort of self correcting mechanism is, is construed through the idea of ethics, responsibilities, and in international worldview. And that sort of maps on to the idea of wealth creation. Uh, a rule enforcing state, uh, uh, a non intrusive one, and then sustainable growth. So these are sort of you know uh, the contours of what I would define as Kapila's view of dharmic capitalism. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that gives us a conceptual map uh, that can help us understand the link between accountability and fusing that with ownership through institutions, through responsibilities, and through a foundation of ethics. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, I would really encourage that all of us read this book because it has a lot of potential to expand. And that brings me to my last question, and I'll actually club two dimensions uh, here, uh, Shiram. One is the idea of institutions itself. How would you uh, define that, you know, if you've studied the work of Douglas North and others who write about institutions? What does the Arthashastra have to say about uh, institutions? Uh, and uh, extension of that, how would you like for all of your audience to consume this book? You spoke about three different kinds of audiences. Uh, you know, how can this book inform something about uh, mind making uh, within the academia? How do you think it should inform the policy making? What are the sort of uh, future activities that you envisage that we can all collaborate on? Yeah, thank you. So I think the role of institutions is quite important, at least from um, how Kautalia viewed um, uh, his uh, idea of uh, uh, economic policy making. Uh, there are two, I would, I would say, two layers to it. One, the state and the institution, um, how, you know, the approach of the state has a bearing on how the institutions function. Uh, and two is the individual sort of uh, 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 nascent element of institutions. So uh, with regard to the state, he's fairly clear. You know, Kautilya might have really strong, uh, you know, punishments in some cases, uh, but he has well-defined rules. So it's a very detailed state, uh, um, uh, you know, contrary to what people say uh, or, or what people have uh, commented, uh, uh, it's not a socialist state by any means. He doesn't sort of control day-to-day -day activities, say, for example, uh, say, if there's a, if, if me and Raghav are trading uh, X number of goods, Kautilya doesn't tell you how many goods you need to trade. A socialist or a communist state does that. So what, what he would do is he would define the parameters of trade, for example, between the two of us, and then say that if you cross the line or if you don't follow the rules, then the punishment is severe. So that's the you know sort of 
role of a state, which which Kautilya uh, envisaged. Uh, second is on institutions. Institutions, I think, integrity, uh, a clean administration, uh, clean leadership. Kautilya always believed that uh, the king uh, is is at best a servant of the people, uh, and he needs to cater to the welfare of the people, um, and uh, he needs to be clean. If the king and the his kids are not clean, he advocates them to be replaced, uh, you know, with others. So. Uh, clean leadership, clean administration, and 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 very sort of transparent institutions uh, is what he, he envisaged. And, and and lastly, on this point, you know, this is a team that you find across the Alastair. You know, in terms of labor contracts, it's just another example. Uh, you could you could find that uh, uh, Kautilya wants uh, uh, employees and the employer to share the labor contracts publicly, even though it is a daily wage laborer, for example. You know, the, the sort of contractual elements that we talk today for daily wage labor as Kautilya already had that idea. So he's sort of, it's consistent that he is open, he's for transparency and he believes in clean institutions. Uh, and on your point related to how this book is consumed, um, I think uh, for, for all the, you know, academics in the audience, it would be really useful if this book is used uh, for a wide variety of, you know, cross-sectional uh, uh, courses, because um, there's very, first of all, there's very little reading material on the subject. So this is probably the first or second book related to Cordelia's economics and its public policy. And, and two, it definitely provides an insight into indigenous thinking uh, within public policy and economic thinking. And that's very important, uh, you know, without a sort of an indigenous civilization understanding, you know, no civilization can sort of move forward on its own, uh, whether it's capitalism through the idea of Protestant ethic or, or the Chinese model of governance or even the Japanese model of governance. All of it is, is a derivative of their civilizational, you know, sort of, sort of principles, whatever they are. I think for us to sort of, you know, develop this, to debate and discuss these ideas, it needs to go to students and young people, which is why, you know, I make it an effort to, to go to business schools, you know, institutions uh, uh, and people and academics across board to sort of get this awareness so that, you know, this, this sort of creates more discussions and ideas. And hopefully in another 10 years when you're talking, we'll have 10, 15 books like this for us to discuss. All right. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll end on that optimistic note. Maybe you'd want to show that again, uh, you know, the cover of the book. Uh, and uh, sure. really, yeah. so that's the book. Uh, I would uh, highly recommend this. Like I said, it changed a few ideas that I thought uh, I had well settled. But uh, once again, thank you, Shiram. Uh, uh, wish you a speedy recovery. And uh, certainly take your message that this book needs to be engaged with and it should produce newer forms of thought. And all of that should lead to the framework of Dharma capitalism that you laid out for us. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. It was a very lively session after lunch, isn't it? Hmm? Thank you, Raghavji and Professor Desi Rajuji and Sri Ramji for the wonderful insights. And now we go to the last session of this evening before we have Professor Sumesh Kumar's way forward. We are very delighted to have Professor Mahadevanji with us. May I invite you to the stage, sir? And he has authored a book, which I'm sure many of us would know. And if you don't know, it just could be no, because especially for the participants who are here physically and those who are watching us on the YouTube, uh, this whole canvas of the next 14 days is an introduction to the Indian knowledge systems. If you would have seen the uh, the schedule that we have created under the guidance of Professor Kapil Kapoorji, each of the domains talks about the sources and texts. We begin with that. 
the schools and thinkers, then the cogent statement of knowledge and ideas, and the applications and way forward for different domains. It's an introduction to the entire Indian knowledge systems, and we have a book by Professor Mahadevan who has written a book on introduction to Indian knowledge systems. Is it available online, sir? Uh, online available, yes. So especially for the FTP participants who are watching us online, I'm, I know a couple of participants who will be joining us online, and those who are here, maybe if you could avail that book and the book that Sri Ramji has authored on Kotelyanomics and Gautam Desi Rajuji's book, these will serve as your textbooks for the next 14 days and going forward. So we have about 15, 20 minutes, sir, for you to please give us your thoughts about Indian knowledge systems and the way forward. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed my pleasure, and let me first of all thank uh, Dr. Richard Chopra, AIT Kanpur, because Professor Ganti Murthy is here, the IKS division of AACT, all of you, for inviting me here. I think this is the third in, in the series of such uh, programs, if I may, uh, sort of, uh, yeah. I think I'll start with a very favorite story, which in some way summarizes where we are on matters of Indian knowledge systems. Then I will share some thoughts. There was a sannyasi who was walking into the temple, and as he was about to enter into the temple, there was one, uh, we see in some temples outside, there are a few people sitting and asking for some alms and so on. So there was one person sitting on a nice wooden sort of a platform asking for arms and sannyasi said, uh, I cannot give you anything. I am also supposed to uh, eke out my living by begging. Therefore, I do not really have much to give you. And uh, then he said, you are sitting on some uh, wooden box. What is, what is there inside? We are going to open and see. Then he said, uh, no, no, I am a fourth generation. My great-grandfather also sat on the same box. My grandfather sat, my father sat, and I am now sitting. So what is there to really open and see and so on? They are sitting here for years. So the sannyasi said, uh, fine. As he entered into the temple, he just made one statement and went. He said, whether you sat on the, temp on the box for an hour or a million hour, you may not know what is inside until you open it. So he just went away. So after a few days, this uh, person who was sitting on that uh, wooden, this started making sense. He said, maybe there is some, there is some old lock, it has no key is there, nothing is there. So finally, only this thought just overpowered him. He just took a big stone and then broke that lock and opened it. He found it was full of some, uh, you know, gold and diamond and all that kind of things. So Indian knowledge system is for us like that in a way. We are sitting on a treasure. And uh, the only slight difference is it appears that we go to the rooftop and say we, there is some treasure instead of really opening the box. That's the only difference. <laughs> At least the beggar did not know what is inside. Here we seem to be you know, sending WhatsApp messages saying Indian knowledge is great, this is happening, that is happening and so on and we leave it. At least uh, it has been like that. But the moot point is, why did it happen? In fact, I am not so much interested in talking about what happened. I think enough we have spoken and that is of no consequence. I think, uh, but there is one important point I want to make. See, in this country, we had a concept of Pancha Maha Yajnas. It was a daily sort of, a, I mean, it's a Nitya Karma. It is not daily, Nitya Karma. It is an ordained kind of things that we need to do. So we have Pitru Yajna, which has to be done for the departed answers. You know, we have Deva Yajna, Manushya Yajna, Bhuta Yajna. There is something called Brahma Yajna. Now the nearest that I can talk about of Brahma Yajna is an inbuilt mechanism 
by which the knowledge which is there is passed on down the generation. This was the central theme in Brahma Yajna. If you really look at the core of the idea, that is what it is. A society which decides that I will benefit from all knowledge, but I will not pass it down to the next generation, it's a matter of time. First of all, that society is selfish. How can you say, I need knowledge, but uh, see, that is what is happening. A lot of parents don't go anywhere near their children. I don't know, out of fear or out of uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, etiquette, I do not know what exactly the point. They s stay aloof. So this knowledge, I mean, this is something which has happened in the last, perhaps for a variety of reasons. So that has brought us to that kind of a situation. So therefore, all these efforts that we are starting now, I think are extremely important. Because that generation will thrive. In fact, you know, as a professor of management, let me tell you, there is something called, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, in simple terms, if I have to say, the path that you walk is a function of the path that you already have walked. You know, there is this Gary Hamel and Prahla, this called core competence. We, we teach it in a particular way. In simple English, this is what it is. The path that you can walk is a function of what you have already walked down. So therefore, any society which uh, does not uh, take this quite seriously is a society which is sitting on, a, on a, a clock which is running out. So therefore, for a variety of reasons, we were put in that kind of a mode, but uh, I don't think uh, this society is truly like that. As I have just, uh, as uh, Professor Desiraju was giving many of those things about the, I think there are reasons, let us not get into why, but. The fact is, at least there is an opportunity for us to turn around and uh, do what needs to be done. I can first of all tell you, Indian knowledge system will never become extinct because it has the weight of its own logic and completeness. So I, uh, that's at one level. I don't think it can ever become extinct, right? And the proof of that is a country which is subjected to about 800 to 1,000 years of uh, all kinds of aggressions and so on has been able to, unmindful of all of that, except for the last probably 150 years or 200 years, by and large, even there it has been going on, but the conditions had become uh, progressively difficult. But even after this, there is a lot which is there, which is dormant, which is resident at different uh, uh, levels of the society. So these initiatives are only trying to bring it back to the mainstream. So therefore, first of all, I am personally not very worried whether you know this will happen or that will happen. But what I am really concerned, or what I am uh, really uh, you know uh, uh, interested to share with you, is uh, the way we need to go forward is where we have to think elaborately, because uh, you know. Uh, people say, you know, it, it should start from the schooling, education, what do we do about it, then there is a whole lot of initiatives happening, UGC is doing something, national curriculum framework is trying to do something, all those are happening. Then there is another big conversation that is happening, whether uh, do we simply uh, read the scriptures and bring it to uh, the table or do we do something more about it, how do we bring it to contemporary research. So we are overwhelmed with multiple dimensions on the problem. I am saying this because uh, this should not be the source for us to get distracted or turn the other way. It's very important for us to understand. For a certain discontinuity that we have gone through, this is very natural. Therefore, I think the first thing I want to say is unmindful of all these. I think we must exhibit true Shraddha. If somebody says, My, I, I am very interested in, in the Poshana, in the protection of that, let us do that. If somebody says, I am interested in seeing how it can be brought into the schooling education system, let me invest on it, let us do that. If somebody says, let me see what is the application potential of it and then I want to understand how to do it, let, let us do that. If somebody says, I want to know how to bring it into a teaching and bring it into a formal education, I think the, the field is wild open and in the initial stages, whichever way we go, there can be a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, counterpoints and criticisms and so on, I think the most important thing is we must be unmindful of all of these. That's the most practical thing that we need to do. Now, if you look at what is, and we have had a great uh, tradition of knowledge. That is the strength of this uh, Sanatana Dharma. We have had a great tradition of uh, knowledge. 
And if you look back at those traditions, there were a few things that uh, came to my mind. The first thing I would say, because we need to preserve all of them, because in the last 150 years, our mindset has a little bit changed. So we need to, you know, go back to some of the fundamentals and understand what are the paradigms on which we have to travel this path of knowledge creation. A few things which came to my mind. The first and the most important thing that I find is this society has time and again showed that it is a society for a democracy of, democracy of ideas. Professor Desiraju just now said, shut darshanas. That is a strength. The darshanas are saying, what is the relationship between Jiva, Jagat and Ishwara? That is a fundamental question that we want to answer. And we have taken different approaches. So this country has believed, whereas in the last you know, 100 years, 50 years, there is a certain kind of a convergence of how to think, what to do, which are all some things that we have imbibed from the Western for whatever reasons. I think so the first thing that I want to say is this society strongly believes in democracy of ideas. I think uh, we are entitled to do that inquiry of research in such original terms, notwithstanding what is the consequence of what it is. That's the first rule. I think we need to keep it very, very important. There is enough ground for any number of alternative views and that's the only way it needs to flourish. Second thing, for some reasons we have little bit lost out. Another characteristic feature of the Indian society is to think big on every matter. You know, if you take Mundaka Upanishad, he says, Kasmin Vignate Sarumitam Vignatam Bhavati. That's the question. Look at the gravity of the question that is being asked. Kasmin Vignate Sarumitam Vignatam Bhavati. Tell me by knowing that I'll be known of everything. I think we have to set very high standards of what we want to actually inquire into. Our rishis of time and again, every Upanishad will find like that. In fact, in Chandogya Upanishad, it says, Nal, nalpe sukam asti, bhuma vai sukam. It says, yat uh, alpam tat mrityam, martyam. There is nothing, uh, in small things are all, you know, mortal. The big things are immortal. So in every uh, one of our scriptures, we find that we had a culture of an unfrettered thinking, thinking very big, and thinking about issues for loka sangraha. So these are some of the principles. In fact, other thing which I want to emphasize is we have a certain tendency, I see it over into a little bit of IKS and all that, I find this. There is this excessive tendency for glorification of the past, which we don't have to necessarily do. I think every society has lived its life and have contributed something very useful. We, rather than merely celebrating that and stopping there, I think we need to ask, how do you take it a few steps forward so this glorification of the past and all those are not required. On the other hand, what we can learn, I am seeing some of the session, Professor Ramasrudim, I was going through all these uh, things. I think we have put robust methods of how do you establish knowledge, how do you create knowledge which is robust. I think those ideas we need to certainly, you know, borrow, imbibe bring it into our ways of things. We don't have to stop merely with glorification because there is a little bit of tendency that we sometimes do all that. The other thing which I want to tell about the IKS as an area where we want to move forward, I would like to tell there are a lot of youngsters sitting and I'm very happy seeing that. There is no substitute to reading the scriptures and our knowledge systems in its original. Please don't underestimate the value of this. There is uh, a tendency to, you know, read some translated works, especially the translated works for, by foreign authors. We have to be a little bit careful because in, in, in all fairness, uh, you know, if I, if I tell my joke in my mother tongue in English, you will, instead of laughing, you will start crying. Because, you know, language preserves a lot of things into it. You just try your mother tongue, you take a joke and tell it in some other language, you will understand the gravity of the problem. We should not do that. Because, you know, language preserves us a certain uh, idea, a certain usage pattern, a certain perspective to what is being told and so on. Therefore, there is enormous value. I would like to request that our journey in Indian knowledge system, research, teaching, whatever it is, must begin with a, a sankalpa that I will take one scripture which is of my interest. We don't have to start reading everything. 
I think we can take one scripture which is very close to our heart, which is even a little closer to what I am doing, my interest and so on. I think there is no substitute and that will inform volumes of what we need to do because that's the charm of uh, the scriptures that we have, the knowledge systems that we have. There's another thing which I wanted to uh, say. Coming to teaching, there is a lot of effort to teach Indian knowledge systems uh, in universities and institutions. I want to make this very clear. See, if you ask me to teach anesthesia, I won't teach. Because I am a professor of management. How can I teach anesthesia? Or if you ask some uh, polymer chemist to teach uh, metallurgy, he, he or she will not teach. We have that uh, dharma. But somehow what I find is when it comes to Indian knowledge systems, everybody says, I will teach. I, I think, again, this happens out of a uh, little bit of anxiety, genuine interest and all that. I am not, uh, you know, please don't mistake me if I, I didn't mean any other ways. But I am saying when we have to teach Indian knowledge system, we must invest substantively in reading scriptures, developing the domain expertise, thinking through it in our own ways, rather than uh, in our anxiety to bring, because it, uh, we will do a lot of counter-marketing. We will, uh, instead of serving the cause, we may end up actually damaging the cause even more. I think we have to be very uh, mindful of this trap because I, I've seen it in a few places. I think uh, uh, many things are being attempted. I think it requires hard work and that's the only way we can show our Shraddha. Shraddha towards our Bharatiya Jnana Parampara, the index of showing that Shraddha is the amount of effort we want to put. I think we may have to invest for a few years of serious reading and Guided reading, I would say, because we have to be very, very careful because many of my friends say, no, sir, I will, uh, you know, take, uh, uh, there are good commentaries, then I, you know, even dictionary, I will, Sanskrit is not required, then I give them a, a very favorite example. I, in chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita, I just say one shloka, Uddharet atmana atmanam, na atmanam avasadet, atmaiva banduhu atmanam, atmaiva ripuratmana. There are seven times the word atma has come. And uh, it needs to be understood the way it is intended, I am just giving an example. In the next shloka also, the Atma comes three times. So it is very important that many of these Indian knowledge system, in my own understanding, there is a lot of sukshma tattva. It is not stula. In fact, one foreigner asked me, uh, you know, what is this Indian knowledge system? Uh, I am not able to, you know, make too much sense of it. I asked that gentleman in, in return, do you watch cartoon TV? Or, you know, your kids watch. Yeah, of course, very interesting. Then I ask him, will the cat drive a car and go to a bank and do banking? Full of, if you look at, you know, a cockroach will ride a scooter and sit on a dining table and have a conversation and all that. I tell them, a three-year-old child has the capability to intuitively absorb. Moment you go and sit there, the first question you'll ask is, how can a cockroach drive a scooter? Finished, the whole uh, message is gone. Lot of uh, ideas in Indian knowledge system has that kind of a good artha. We have to be very, very careful. It's not just reading something on the face, on the surface of it. Uh, you know, I am a professor of operations management. My example I give is, Draupati was disrobed in the, you know, uh, after all this uh, thing is over. And I say, if I, if I were to analyze that particular situation by just reading in a very analytical sense, my operations management skills will come first. First, I will ask, what is the rate at which the Draupati sari is being rolled on her? And what is the rate at which the sari is being removed on the other side? Depending upon the relative speed of these two, Draupati will move right or left. I can do calculation and show you, actually. Or I will ask, is there enough raw material for manufacturing the sari? Is the production capacity and uh, supply, supply of uh, sari is uh, commensurate to the demand? That is not the way to read. Because most of our education today has to become too analytical. That's not the way to read. That message was not meant for it. So the very knowledge system that we want to pursue has a certain tradition, has a certain orientation and has a certain culture with which we need to understand and uh, assimilate that, then we will be able to make use of it and create, uh, you know, newer paths, you know, assimilate it, synthesize it in the ways that we need it for the society today. The last thing I would like to say is uh, whether it is teaching or research in Indian knowledge system. I would like to make this request. Context must drive the scripts, scriptures rather than the scriptures drive the context. It becomes very difficult sometimes 
because uh, I, again I see, you know, simply they take Arthashastra and pull uh, something out of it and churn something out of it. I think uh, all these we are doing, I am not suspecting on the intentions, we are, with all our genuity we want to do. I think contextual relevance is very, very useful. Therefore, uh, we must, society has a lot of problems. Society is moving, it's evolving and that is a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, dharma of our ancestors, when problems uh, emerged, they inquired into the problem and came with ways of solving and that's how these scriptures grew continuously. You know, in mathematics and astronomy, you know, uh, Ram Subhanim used to tell you how for 1,400 years it has been continuously evolving. I think we should have that culture in, in us. So therefore, let us talk about the problems, the issues that we face and how in our effort to solve the issues, let's dip into the scriptures, synthesize, deeply understand, synthesize ideas from that, then, you know, there is a possibility that we can create and we can regain the last glory that we have uh, in the last, you know, few uh, years and so on. I think uh, with this I would, uh, I'll make it, I have an hour and a half tomorrow to share a few more thoughts, so I don't want to get too much detail into it. It's a great effort by, uh, uh, Dr. Richard and all those uh, people, I, I mean, it's simply evident by the messages in the WhatsApp, if that is an indication of what it is. Enormous thinking, enormous attention to details, enormous effort has gone behind it. There's no way this seminar can uh, result in anything other than a great success. I pray to the Almighty that uh, let this take to greater heights in the years to go. I will just, I am just reminded of one, um, you know, uh, part of uh, Sikshavalli uh, in Taitri Upanishad, which is very apt. Let me say, Amayantu Brahmacharina Swaha, Vimayantu Pramayantu, Damayantu Shamayantu. Let us have thousands of branches for each of the teachers and let this IKS grow in great strength and uh, let's have the, you know, uh, the joy and the uh, uh, contentment of uh, being part of this Sanatan Dharma. Thank you for this opportunity. I actually feel very overwhelmed <laughs> with uh, whatever Professor Mahad Mahad Mahadevanji has shared. That's the sign of a, there's a sign of intuition and that is what our Vidya is all about, that's a sign about, uh, it's all about the greatness and how we understand what is happening just through the observation of few things. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So we come to the end of the session and I would just like to share one small story. If So there was a grandfather and a grandson and they were both walking by the beach and when the wave comes, there are thousands of starfish that come to the shore and if they're not thrown back into the water, they will die. So this grandson, he picks one starfish and throws it back to the water. And he takes the second and he throws into the water. He takes the third and throws it into the water. And the grandfather says, there are thousands, it's not going to make a difference to anybody. Why are you doing this effort? So the grandson picks the fourth one and he says, it's going to make a difference too this one. He picks the fifth and he says it's going to make a difference to this one. So all the efforts that each one of us are doing in whatever little ways and understanding that we have, it is going to make a difference somewhere. And very beautifully said, it doesn't matter what you do, whether it is about the poshana or it is about the application of Indian knowledge system. Whatever we do, the tapas, the effort, the time spent on it, I could really resonate with this, that nothing happens without that tapas and the time spent. And most importantly, I'm reminded of what Gurudev says is walking the talk. That's very important. When we walk the talk, things just exude and things just start happening around us. Knowledge has organizing power is what I understand. If, if knowledge is there with us, if you're living that knowledge, things will just happen through us effortlessly. So may I invite Professor Sumesh Kumarji, he is the internal advisor to the, dip, to the Center of Excellence for Indian Knowledge Systems, again, background of statistics. And for the way forward, the reflections, we start with our classes tomorrow, 56 lectures, every day, four sessions a day. And 
sir, your reflections and way forward before we go for Rasanubhuti with Kaushiki Chakravarti ji. I'll have a few small announcements after Professor Sumesh Kumar and then we'll proceed forward. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, who has contributed to organization of uh, this particular FDP and all the esteemed speakers that we have today and uh, for the next 14 days. So this is really wonderful and uh, I must appreciate the team led by Richaji of inviting so many people and the persons who have agreed to come here. So. I mean, each of them is an expert in their own right in different domains. Uh, let me start with the topic that we have chosen, that is the Baudhik Atma Nirbharta. Uh, so, I mean, I think uh, time and again, every speaker has been mentioning about uh, the Indian knowledge system and so on. So, what is the primary thing? Like, when we study today in the school education, so we talk about various things, I mean like we read Archimedes laws, we then read Pythagoras theorem, then we read uh, Newton's laws, then we read Laplace transform and uh, where are the things which are contributed by the Indians, why that is not there? So the answer to that lies in certain time period where uh, you can say that we were detached from our own thing and then something else was taught and therefore this thing was somehow missed up. Now, like, so I have also studied in that education system only. Uh, but slowly when, so the ultimate thing is that when you study more or you, you go through more things, then you come across things and then you question that why it was not called Baudhayan's theorem or, uh, or like that. I mean, similarly about other rules and other laws, uh, even some equation which is now very well known as a Pell's equation, then I found that uh, and it is said that uh, Euler mentioned in his, uh, country, I mean, in his uh, letter to another mathematician and he said it's Pell's equation. Then I read what Pell has done. So John Pell, he was a British mathematician. So I found that he has never done anything in that equation at all. He just used that somewhere in his uh, work. And, uh, and then uh, Euler said Pell's equation, so it became Pell's equation and now we have papers and just very recently Springer has published a big volume. Uh, so Pell's equation, its applications and uh, now they have found the applications in uh, cryptography and so on. Uh, but when you go through the ancient literature, so we find in 629 in Brahmaguptas, he has given one algorithm to solve and he has actually solved some of the special cases. And then we have Narayan Pandita and uh, then Bhaskaracharya and they have given much better methods. They have improved upon those methods and given more solutions. And then in uh, 20th century, that is in I think 1926, we have a solution by Iyengar who has proved the uh, consistency of the algorithm. So why not it is called uh, Brahmagupta equation or Brahmagupta Bhaskara equation? I mean, so that is the problem. When we say Baudhik Atmanirbharta, so now, we are talking about Atmanirbharta in manufacturing uh, in the morning. I think uh, our director was mentioning about uh, uh, like uh, manufacturing semiconductors here, like a lot of fine things, like even we produce mobile phones and other things, but a lot of uh, components or micro components are the important components we actually import from other places. So that was like Atmanirbharta in those things. But Baudhika Atmanirbharta, it stands for all these things. That means bringing out that what was done here and why we are using others' names there. So why not bring it up? So like I now give lectures on this Pell's equation, but I call it Brahmagupta Bhaskara equation, not, I won't call it Pell's equation because there is no historical background to being it invented by Pell. And similarly, there are many other equations which are called Diophantine equations. And then when you read through, we have references uh, in first century AD and so on, where we have many mathematical contributions, where the solutions of those uh, equations where you are having positive integral solutions there. 
So again, the question comes, why do we call them just Diophantine equations? So it is, I think, just an imitation that we are taking. So Atmanirbharata means that we should feel pride are proud that we have done. There are many things. Okay, as for every knowledge system, everybody, I mean, uh, every knowledge system doesn't have everything. So they, it's continuously evolving. There must have been something done in Greece, something must have been done in Rome, something must have been done in Egypt, and so on. But if they are naming their systems, then why we are not naming our systems? So like we say Euclidean geometry. So was the Euclid only one? that who developed that he wrote uh, the 12 volumes of the Euclid's elements. So now when I have now explored and we read through a lot of books, then we find that yes, uh, I mean like uh, I have found the, all the bricks uh, structures which were made in the Harappa, Mohan, Jodhro time, they are also having some fixed ratios. Uh, the length is to width is to the height of the bricks and also the construction of the walls they have some dimensions and they have some ratios like somewhere it is 5 is to 4, somewhere it is 1.7 to 1.9 and so on. So it cannot be done that there was no geometrical thing, otherwise they won't be able to make uh, uniform things. So when we say, okay, Euclidean geometry, fine, but you also find out our own resources. The Atmanir Bharata means that we should be proud of our own things. So well, fortunately I am from a discipline, uh, I am a statistician. And I can say, and we actually always quote, a uh, lot of results are there. So we talk about Mahalanobis D square, we talk about uh, Rao Kramer inequality. So in the books we, when you read, they write Kramer Rao inequality. Okay, so it is an inequality for certain optimality condition. But when you see the reference, uh, C.R. Rao proved it in 1945. So he was, uh, he had become a faculty member in the University of Calcutta and in the class some question was asked. For answering that question he derived that. Then in 1947 Harold Kramer has done it. But in all the books of statistics they write Kramer Rao inequality and it is called like that. CR inequalities, inequalities of CR type and so on. So when I started teaching I put it as Rao Kramer inequality. Why do you call it? <laughs> so I mean. We ourselves, de I mean, sort of denigrate ourselves uh, that uh, why uh, it should be like that. It, it should be the person who has done it first and when the credit is being taken, we should take our credit what has been done by our thing. So Rao's score test, then they put Fisher's score test. Actually Fisher never gave that score test. It is actually done by Rao. Fisher actually used and Fisher uh, was super uh, super PhD supervisor of CR Rao. But uh, so when the, in many of the Western textbooks, they write fisher Rao test or Fisher's test itself. They won't write uh, Rao's test. Actually, it's Rao's score test. So I think by Atman Nirvarta in Baudhik sense, we mean that we should shed this uh, habit of denigrating ourselves. I mean, we should put our own people like, there is a tendency, especially in the higher order academics, that academicians that we, like if there is a person in your own department, he will be, he m must have done some results, but when you do work in that direction, we don't quote him. I think we should do that. We will, we cannot ignore outside people because when we submit to a journal, the re uh, reviewer will write that you have missed out these references. But for our own people, we won't do that. So I think that should be avoided. I think these are some general comments that I have given about but there are many more things. I think we have very little time. Just maybe I will take three, four minutes to say things. Uh, so our uh, education system was based on Gurukulas. So by Gurukulas we mean that uh, we had Rishis and so basically they were great teachers and but what was important about that Gurukulas? That means the rishis or the teachers there, I mean, Gurukul doesn't mean that only one teacher was there, there were many other people also. So they were also, but they lived a life which is to be followed by the disciples. I think that was the most important thing. I mean, there was a textual knowledge which was imparted in the form of uh, certain mathematics, certain uh, uh, religious things and uh, say other knowledge systems that were imparted in the Gurukula. But what was the most important? 
the most important part was the lifestyle that they were following. And therefore, the disciples, they followed that thing. That means, what you want to teach, you actually be that, you follow that. And then, if you follow that lifestyle, see, like we nowadays say that, uh, we make a lot of complaints. We say that students are cheating in the exams or they cheat, they tell lies. Okay, is it that we also tell lies? So the students will be following that. So it comes from the schools. Rather than telling the student not to tell a lie, we should follow that we don't tell a lie. If we do that, then the student will also not tell that thing. So I think when we talk about moral education, moral education is not to be written in the textbook and taught to the student and he will write an exam on that. It has to be followed. And that fo so the real Bauddhika Atmanirbharata will come when we have the practice. And we talk about do it yourself, DIY labs and so on. So that is an effort in those directions only. But the most important part is the moral part of that thing. Why uh, you can say the Sanatan Sabhita or Sanatan Dharma has survived and many other civilizations have collapsed is because of that only. So I think we should keep that into mind. I have given some very general comments here, but probably that is the purpose of that because specific comments will be there or specialist lectures are there throughout this workshop for the next two weeks which you will be enjoying. Uh, we should put more effort on the lifestyle that we are following rather than teaching that lifestyle. We should follow it ourselves and then it will go to the other people, uh, to the children, to the students and to everybody. Thank you very much. I think I should not take too much time. People have already exhausted for the whole day. Thank you, Richa ji. So with this, we conclude the inaugural. And I'm sure we enjoyed the conversations, yes? A lot of thoughts would have already started uh, would have seeded ki aage kya karna hai chauda din mein and how do we look at all the sessions, lectures and how do we interact with all our faculty members in the next 14 days so that we can really make the most of, his, most of it. So I welcome each one of you to IIT Kharagpur once again to the speakers, to the guests, to all the faculty members who have come from all over the country for this physical residential FTP and many, many of us who, would, who are joining us and who would be joining for the next two weeks. Uh, we now proceed. We have tea on the way, and uh, tea has come, yes. And then by 6.30, we could come back here to Kalidas Auditorium, and a slight word of caution that it may be extremely full because of Kaushik EG and uh, uh, it may be better if we come a little early and find our seats. Hmm? and really enjoy the concert. We'll have a participatory session with Kaushikiji, that's how we are planning it, so that she can talk about how she has been groomed through the Guru Shishya Parampara and how she has reached uh, the way she is today. So we'll have a participatory session and with her very talented accompanists. So thank you once again, and for the FTP participants, we reconvene here tomorrow morning at 8.55. The sessions would start on time and on time, and there would be an attendance. We'll follow the UGC HRDC protocols, and happy studying for the next two weeks. Namaste, Dhanavada. That's Kaushiki ji, we'll watch her live in some time.
For the speakers and the guests in Kalidas Auditorium, the first two rows will be blocked. The first two rows are reserved for the speakers and the guests. So please go to the first two rows. Thank you. 6.30 we start. Please reach there accordingly. Namaste. Ah! Uh -huh. 